uh, you, you all know him. I, I'd like to keep it short. So, um, Larius is a professor in the University of Southampton. He has the communications uh, group uh, there in the University of Southampton. Uh, he has many awards and distinctions. I mean, we've allocated 45 minutes for his talk. I could take the whole talk and, and list all these awards, but I'm not going to do it, Laios. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're happy to hear. Uh, I just want to highlight that Laios is a fellow of the IEEE, fellow of the IET, fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, fellow of Eurosip. He's authored many books. He lists uh, more than 10,000 pages on uh, radio communications on his CV, though I'm sure this is out of date. It's more like... Uh, 100,000 these days. Um, he's acted as general chair in many uh, IEEE conferences, top conferences, editor-in-chief in IEEE transactions, and many other um, you know, distinct activities within the community. And importantly, he's been a, a huge mentor for, for a lot of people, and uh, also a lot of us here uh, today. So with that, uh, and without further ado, I'd like to hand over the ball again to Laios. So if I stop sharing, and then... Thank you so much, Christos. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I'm just trying to hand you the presenter's uh, role. I think, uh, uh, okay, you did, okay. Otherwise, I, I can do it. Okay, Laius, you should be able to share your slides now. Okay, let's see whether that happens. Uh, What can you see right now? Uh, we can see your video. Uh, you don't see the title slide? No, unfortunately. No, okay. Then I minimize this again for a moment mm -hmm. and go back to the control. I think if you share your, you, you click on share content and pick the, the PDF for the PPT uh, application. You yeah, have. that's that's what I did. So, what do you see from me right now? Uh, we don't see your screen. We see your video. Okay, let's try again. Uh, so it comes up with share content, and it it says, okay, sh ah, there's a second stage. Yeah, there you go. Now Is it all right me. now? Okay. And now we see your browser. Maybe. Right. Yes. What about now? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Let's rock and roll. Excellent. Thank you Excellent. so much for the exciting introduction. I really miss a good party with you guys at UCL because I know that Christus and Dizat throw a good party, but we will do that next time. So this has been an exciting journey and I hope I will be able to make this sort of reasonably animated despite the physical distance between us guys. Uh, it's like a distributed network. Uh, let's hope that uh, you've got reasonably good connections as well. So uh, this will be a, a bit of a science fiction type journey. Uh, hope that I will be able to cut out really some interesting research problems in some places, I will be actually galloping a little bit, uh, but you would find related papers at our website or at Tripoli Explore. And again, sincere thanks for the invitation. I won't linger on this very much, but there's a huge number of uh, professional friends with whom I uh, enjoyed collaboration and learned a lot from the, the sponsors. Uh, some of it has come from industry, uh, Cobham Thales, TSB, EPSRC, and my advanced fellow grant. So I hope you can see my cursor here. Uh, so here is London. We all know where London is. Uh, this is the M25 where I'm circling. And this is where little Southampton is on the map. And the western tip of the Isle of Wight here is the place where Marconi first time ever demonstrated the feasibility of radio transmissions across the Atlantic. And so there's a plaque there, and uh, so Southampton is claiming to be an old communications group going back to the beginnings. And that's why I said, you know, live through the communications era version 1.0. And so we will, of course, uh, look into uh, our little journey uh, through the decades and generations of wireless systems. I will be looking more broadly than just really looking at energy efficiency 
Christus and I often discuss these kind of things, and I like a, a well-balanced design. So uh, we are at the top of this building back in 2005. We had a devastating fire, which uh, was caused uh, by a cable fire in the Optical Research Center down here. Again, Izzat has many friends there and former PhD students, and we are at the top of this building, uh, again, sitting on top of the ORC. Hopefully, there won't be any more cable fires. So, the journey, still a journey, but uh, I slowed down now and I would like to really sort of invite you for a little stroll with Shannon, how we actually got closer and closer to capacity over the decades. And I don't want to go back to 1948 because even in 1980 there was a famous workshop, uh, the so-called coding is dead workshop, where people said, well, there's nothing more we can do in coding uh, because it's so complex and so on. And then, of course, the turbo revolution uh, allowed us to get closer and closer. Looking back in time again for a moment, of course, still historically, uh, we know about Gallagher's LDPC codes. And in 1963, he was actually able to uh, demonstrate almost near capacity performances with the aid of uh, his iterative uh, LDPC codes. But, you know, jumping ahead again to the 1990s, so this was the exciting era when our road trip took us to MIMO quarters here. So you see BLAST, uh, Spatial Division, Multiplexer, Space-Time Coding, an exciting journey, really exciting journey. And I will talk a little more about this uh, stroll with Shannon as we go along, but uh, we eventually, in the 2000s, arrived at 4G Terrace. So all these big roads, the MIMO streets, led up to 4G Terrace, and unfortunately, at that stage, multi-carrier OFDM did not make it into the standard, even though there were proposals on OFDM, but it wasn't sufficiently mature. So basically, it took another decade or so to develop uh, OFDM in, uh, from 3G into 4G, where we finally ended up uh, using uh, OFDM. And then, of course, uh, different variants of multi-carrier systems have found their way also into the 5G proposals. Again, this would be a different talk, so I won't delve into too much detail about 5G. Uh, I'd rather focus a little bit on, on the future, really. And instead of pursuing Quantum Avenue, which is one of my favorite uh, research topics, uh, there is another tangential road here, namely towards 6G. And the question, of course, in, in the first slide was, will it work, right? So, you know, join me in this kind of crystal ball gazing and moving into the future. And really, again, crisscrossing history, 1965 is the time, right? And so we had Gordon Moore uh, you know, speculating about the future of the semiconductor industry and figured out that, well, it seems like based on the past, uh, every 18 months or so, we double the integration density. So uh, we are now in 2020 and really entering the nanoscale integration. So we are entering this, this kind of fuzzy regime between the classical physics and quantum physics, where the weird and kind of uh, alluring laws of quantum physics start to prevail because seven nanometers integration is possible now. So what are we going to do with this huge signal processing capability? And that's really what I will probably delve into in a little more detail. Again, I will be galloping in some places because the time is short, but uh, hopefully you will get the broad brush of what I'm trying to really convey here. So from the motivation, moving uh, really to the uh, next slide and talk about the current situation, uh, still with a focus on 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. So down here at the bottom right hand corner, you can see we have the 2G systems in blue, very little 2G coverage left in the UK, up in the north of Scotland. And then we have the 3G, again, very little actually, it's all kind of replaced by 4G and 4G plus, maybe not quite 5G, but claimed to be 5G. So See, there is, there's very good coverage in the densely populated areas where the revenue is, right? But if you look at Scotland, you can look at Northern Ireland, 
the old farmers chugging along on his tractor and not generating much tele-traffic. So the service providers unfortunately have these huge coverage holes and really uh, you only have these sausage cells beaming down the street or down the the roads, but basically, uh, if you are up in the mountains in Wales, for example, you have zero coverage almost. So that's the UK. What about the US? Well, similar situation really. You see all these vast plains where all the wheat is coming from, but again, the old uh, farmers chugging along on a combined harvester and not getting, not generating much teletraffic. What about Saudi Arabia, you know, just sampling the world in a random fashion? You see that in the desert, absolutely nothing. Of course, Federico probably will talk a little bit about how satellite phones, phones and satellite coverage can help. And that's, of course, uh, part of my integrated, almost utopian vision, if you like. So moving on. Uh, you know, Scandinavia has always been famous, really, for uh, wireless communications. Uh, they created the first ever uh, international system which allowed cross-border communications in the Scandinavian countries, even in the analog era, even in the 1G era. And they were very instrumental in catalyzing GSM in order to come up with the pan-European uh, first ever digital mobile radio system, which then became the global system of mobile communications because it was so popular, right? Again, you know, the nice story is probably more for an after-dinner talk, reminiscing how it all kind of was uh, happening. But India, the subcontinent, a billion subscribers, despite the relative low income, but huge uncovered areas, and we know about the economic impact of uh, wireless communications, how it can help you explore new markets, sell your products more broadly, etc. So it is really vital. I'm still only talking about the motivation here. See that, uh, you know, 4G plus coverage is really just here, uh, maybe in, in Chennai and, uh, you know, some of the uh, sort of premier cities, but look at France, that's amazing. I, I actually thought that one of the best engineers in Europe were the Germans, but look at the French, they're not doing badly either, right? Pretty amazing, and uh, you know, there's really hardly any 3G, it's all high rate 4G, 4G plus. So that's what we're really trying to achieve providing internet coverage for the remaining 4 billion across the planet, right? And of course, some providers go up and put up uh, mobile masts on, on high mountains, but uh, they still can't cover the valleys very well. So this leads me to this uh, utopian vision of integrated ground air space networks. And that's what really is the main thrust of the rest of the talk. Uh, this morning, my hope is to, to enthuse you to look into this very interesting super heterogeneous network uh, where we have tiny little cells, even indoor cells in airplanes and uh, in the offices where we are all locked up right now. And then uh, you could have uh, the the UAVs, of course, uh, you know, regulations have it at maximum 120 meter altitude. And the trouble here is energy efficiency is bismal. Obviously, keeping them in the air just to get you know, a, a few coals supported uh, is not economically viable, really. Okay, so obviously for rescue, etc., it is. But their counterparts up in the stratosphere, uh, you know, 17,000, 20,000 meters, uh, you know, the solar charge plays can stay up there for, for a whole year. Um, and then we have the, the planes at about 10 kilometers up, up there, 10 to 12 kilometers, and they have a large density actually. So, so we could equip all the planes uh, with uh, a cheap and cheerful transceiver and uh, they could provide radio coverage and their footprint on the ground wouldn't be as huge as that of satellites and so uh, the area spectral efficiency could remain relatively high. But there will be still areas where we must use the satellites and of course uh, you see here in the top right hand corner 
We've got the low Earth orbit satellites uh, between, say, 500 and 900 kilometers. Then we have the medium Earth uh, satellites and then the geostationary ones. But of course, they are very special and everybody wants them, uh, despite the fact that their delay is actually 120 milliseconds at the speed of light. So it's not very good, really, uh, for um, uh, lip synchronized video transmissions, for example, because we would just cut into each other's voices all the time. There is the ships as well, of course. Look, you know, there's a huge number of ships uh, all the time. And on each cruise ship, uh, OK, they're not going now, but they will return. And there's maybe 5,000 people on them. They're all starved from uh, using internet uh, as they would normally. And so they could be really supported again. But, you know, again, given the amount of time I must get on, even though anecdotally there's a lot more to share. So you could imagine a system where you could actually hop through from London Heathrow to JF Kennedy all the way uh, using airplanes, uh, so plane-to-plane -plane communications, or you could imagine this kind of you know, simplified three-layer system here. We have the ground station, the aircraft, and the satellites. And they all have very different propagation delays, very different bandwidths and carrier frequencies. That's why I call this a super heterogeneous network. And so you could, however, escape from the ground here and you know, jump up to the planes and the routing would become a challenging problem. Routing, power control, and uh, resource allocation in general. So uh, if you are really you know, just starting out on painless and uh, you would like to you know, find an exciting research topic. This is more frontier research than tweaking the transceiver performance by 1 dB. So this is the whole gamut, and this alone really requires a lot of time to talk you through because we have here all the different, uh, you know, the line of sight strength and the, the terrain shadowing, the multipath fading. Uh, the Doppler frequency, all those factors that really critically affect the overall performance. And so uh, in the left column, we have obviously the terrestrial cellular. At the right hand side, we have uh, the uh, civil aviation planes. Mm, the second from the right, we have the fixed wing uh, gliders aircraft, which are really solar charged. These are the rotary wing quadcopters, and then potentially tethered balloons or, or uh, high altitude, other types of high altitude platforms. Again, I'll come back to this uh, a little uh, later, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. You know, several companies have experimented uh, with these high altitude platforms. Uh, there are huge problems, of course, because not only uh, that uh, they are solar charged, and so so they have to. Uh, come down for maintenance once in a while, but uh, uh, they their coverage on the ground uh, moves around uh, with the wind and all sorts of propagation factors. This is another kind of conceptual high altitude platform, and uh, that's another one again. Allegedly, this can really stay up uh, between half a year and, and a year before it has to come down. It's all covered in, in solar cells. Uh, so just like the satellites, it, it critically depends on solar activity. And uh, so we have to really squeeze out the most we can from the transceiver's uh, power budget margins. Right. So on to one of the aspects, because I have very limited time, so I will just really talk about uh, how we can really assist communications with the aid of planes and possibly you know, ships uh, as they float around. And uh, uh, if you uh, would like to delve into this in more detail, just visit this uh, URL. It's actually fun watching the planes as they approach London Heathrow or JFK, whatever your favorite airport, uh, and, and land or um, uh, take off. Uh, you see it live. Now, the European picture looks really ad hoc, uh, as opposed to, for example, at the right hand side, you see the London Heathrow to America and then America back to Europe uh, coming back. Uh, you see that this, these are like little ants almost following each other uh, with the jet stream coming back along a different route. 
And so, of course, there would be sporadic coverage, uh, but uh, you see, this is uh, a true snapshot which we have taken on a reasonably good day, not on Christmas Day, uh, but uh, when the tourist season is uh, blooming, for example, in the summer. And so uh, we don't have good coverage uh, of the seas and oceans, uh, but otherwise we could actually use the plane transponders and uh, uh, this is the complement of it, the ships. So you see, this is again the land area covered by ships, sorry, by planes, and the, these are the seas and the oceans. Uh, I won't sort of bore you with the color coding, you know, green is cargo ships and uh, blue is uh, cruise ships, etc. Uh, but, you know, these two actually together uh, could provide very, very good coverage of remote areas. You might remember that there was this Malaysian aeroplane, for example, which was lost uh, maybe three years ago. In fact, not one, but two of them. And they never found, never recovered the black box. So actually, nobody found out uh, what happened because they were beyond uh, the radio horizon and uh, they lost communications. So statistically speaking, uh, we have here the red line. You see the, the little squares indicating the uh, number of flights coming from, uh, uh, this is westbound, so from London Heathrow to uh, the large American airports at the East Coast. And during midnight uh, and 8, 8 a.m., not much happening, maybe 40, 20 planes or so. But uh, then uh, in the morning, it starts to intensify and it goes up to 240 planes taking off. And uh, then interestingly, the eastbound flight kind of compensates for it. So basically, you would have these flying base stations, if you like. And uh, of course, the propagation is challenging because they travel at uh, 300 meters per second. So let's look at some of the scenarios. If uh, some of the early career researchers are working on application layer things, um, you know, depends on where we are in this cycle. You know, taxiing is just 10 meters per second, taking off maybe 20 to 150 meters per second. And then en route, uh, I mentioned, it, it could actually be 620 uh, meters per second if planes are passing or traveling in the opposite directions. And then holding before landing and then taxiing, parking, and very different propagation scenarios, of course. And so uh, a little bit about that later on. But as I mentioned, uh, beyond the horizon, radio propagation is a challenging issue. Uh, basically, the higher the, the planes are, uh, the farther the radio horizon would be. And uh, so from the simple geo. Mm, since we lost Laios. Hi, Laios. Can you hear us? Mm. No, it was getting interesting, yeah? Yeah, I, I think we can. Oh, he's ah, right. Yeah. Okay, we can we uh, have you back. I think. I don't know what happened, but uh, what was the last slide you have seen? So the the ge geometrical. Uh, you were interpreting the geometrical. Okay. No? Okay. So can you see the slides? We can see the slide now. Uh, okay. And Lyos, just to let you know, if you if you can wrap up in the next ten minutes or so, so we can keep on. Yes. Okay. Out. Yeah. I'll, I'll gallop a little bit here, uh, so move on here to try and recover and, and look at the applications very briefly. So, you know, the obvious uh, and most important application is, of course, air traffic control uh, in aircraft communications that is quite vital. Uh, 
but uh, there are other useful services, uh, obviously tracking of aircraft and then up uploading, downloading information, in-cabin communications, and so on. Uh, they all really use very different frequencies. Uh, but there's another very important one, just like migratory birds uh, and military aircraft, we could actually uh, have ultra-reliable low latency communications uh, amongst the uh, civil aviation planes as well, and they could fly information, and that certainly would uh, reduce drag and so ultimately save a lot of aviation fuel. Uh, so specif specifications and challenges, uh, because uh, I, I really want to sort of uh, remain on, on time, but there is really, apart from the compelling applications that we're talking about, there's this extremely important problem of not just optimizing uh, power consumption or uh, aiming for near capacity communications, but actually exploring all the optimum operating points of the so-called Pareto front which is basically a multi-component optimization problem. And, you know, just try to imagine the simplest form, which is a triangle. We have uh, the power, the bit error ratio, and the throughput. I can always improve the throughput if I increase the power because I use higher throughput modulation schemes, or I can reduce the bit error ratio if I increase the power, but I can't do all simultaneously, right? So something must yield. And this is the essence of uh, power, uh, Pareto optimization, which I will uh, conclude with. And it's, it's a, a really blossoming, uh, but still fairly open research area. So just to mention again that uh, I alluded to the, the very different carrier frequencies uh, for you know, ground to satellite and uh, ground to aircraft, aircraft to aircraft, uh, all bismally low bandwidth, unfortunately, because these are very conservative systems that were designed a long, long time ago based on international standardization. And so it's very conservative, very limited in terms of bandwidth. Lots of standards as well. Again, uh, you can find details about this in, in the literature down here, but uh, different standards for aircraft to ground, aircraft to aircraft, aircraft to satellite, and, and even within uh, the cabin. Uh, visible light communications has been also suggested for in-cabin communications because it doesn't interfere with radio frequencies, for example. So it's an extremely uh, compelling design alternative. And so coming really to the sort of last uh, section in this talk, uh, just to try and uh, sort of uh, allude again to my little chat with Shannon, uh, who is really the founding father of our discipline. You know? so, so how do we design an optimum AI net and aeronautical ad hoc network, Dr. Shannon, I might ask. Um, and so an important point, and then I will probably uh, not go through all the options here in the interest of time, is the Gupta Kumar law, uh, which simply says that the per node capacity of large ad hoc networks tends to zero, simply because you have to relay so many messages from the source to the destination that you hardly ever get a chance to transmit your own information. And, and that is a limitation. Uh, but of course, again, it has to be a large network. And uh, if we have very efficient routing protocols, especially in the quantum era, we could use quantum search algorithms for this high value application. So again, I won't, won't linger on these issues now, uh, but I will share with you a couple of you know, Shannonian messages. So Dr. Shannon uh, shared his insight with me and uh, we, we reformulated during our uh, little walk here on the back of an envelope, his uh, famous formula. Uh, first of all, we replaced the signal to noise ratio of the Gaussian channel by SINR. Uh, but observe that unfortunately, this is behind the logarithmic function. So you have to pump in exponentially increasing powers uh, in order to get a linear increase of the capacity. So it's a much better alternative to actually use uh, a larger number of antennas or a wider bandwidth because both of these increase the capacity linearly as opposed to logarithmically. 
So I allude to, to these Shadonia lessons a little more as we go along, but these are this sort of whole spectrum of different frequencies, and uh, we moved on from the classic radio frequencies to you know sub six uh, gigahertz to millimeter wave frequencies, and then uh, you see here in the middle the visible light band, where of course uh, we have much more bandwidth, but uh, we don't have fast enough or wide bandwidth LEDs uh, to uh, exploit all this bandwidth. And then beyond that, there is you know other bands where with small distances, we could uh, use it usefully for communication. But free space optical communication is a very important area to look into. So I will just take you through the, uh, the, the, the basics of the associated power budget design, where we have the, the path loss, the shadow fading, and the fast fading. And so the received signal with a high probability has to be above the receiver sensitivity level. And um, I will just uh, refer you here to Eric Haas's famous paper on uh, the aeronautical channel characteristics, almost 20 years old, but it's still the best one around because it's so extremely expensive to to sort of make these uh, channel measurement campaigns. And so very briefly, just visually, the channel characteristics, you know, en route, uh, we have very high Doppler frequency. So this is here time and this is here frequency. So it's almost like independent fading, if you like. And it would be really, really futile to try and use channel estimation, accurate channel estimation for this. So this is a good application of the hitherto rather neglected non-coherent type detectors, which dispense with all overheads required for pilots and uh, use uh, non-coherent detection. But when you compare this to the arrival scenario, the fading is much slower, both versus time as well as versus frequency. And uh, this is the taxiing scenario, even lower speed. So in a parking scenario, very different propagation conditions. And we have to have adaptive transceivers which are agile enough to adjust to, to these uh, circumstances. So uh, this is the same picture, but uh, with a, a top view and uh, you know, black here indicates basically the very best, sorry, the very worst channel quality and white is the very best. So you see here that uh, QPSK is the predominant modulation mode um, when we have about 15 dBs or so SNR. And this is the subcarrier index, this is time. So, so we have to have adaptivity, both uh, the time as well as frequency. And uh, again, uh, uh, going back to the Shannonia lessons. So here we see the associated uh, capacity as the distance grows from say, uh, this is 10 kilometers going up to 100 kilometers. The throughput is reduced because predominantly uh, the uh, lower throughput modulation schemes are used. This was a seven mode transceiver in uh, uh, the investigations we looked at. So still on the Shannonian lessons, uh, you know, we, we have heard that uh, we can actually increase the throughput linearly with the number of transmit antennas, but where do we put them on the airplanes? Funnily enough, it's a large bodied vehicle, but uh, the problems are multifold. Uh, the drag, there's about 30 or so antennas already on most of them. And if you put it on top of the wings, you, you can talk to the satellite very well, but not uh, for transmission down to the ground and vice versa. Uh, so here is just a, a really a, a sample of the attainable performances of our advanced layer steered space-time coded schemes, which combine the multiplexing capability of uh, BLAST, and this is why it's called layered, uh, steered because it has beam forming in it, and also space-time coded to enhance the diversity gain. Again, you find uh, you know, these the, the results in the literature, but just to really conclude with the same bold message that we should not uh, design a lopsided system which really just looks at uh, optimizing capacity like in this slide, for example, because we have to talk about the associated complexity, power consumption, delay, etc. And so we created a four component objective function 
which was documented in, in these papers down here at, at the bottom. And uh, we, we then uh, looked at the associated trade-offs and we designed a Pareto optimal system where, for example, if you have more hops, then the hops become much longer uh, and you need therefore more transmit power, but the delay is reduced because the relaying is always associated with first detecting and the retransmitting. So that again just indicates one of these trade-offs and uh, before I conclude, you see here again, say London Heathrow, source node, uh, JFK, destination node, that these red dots are the planes and could be, of course, uh, ships on the ground where we haven't got a plane in the vicinity. And then this is the bit error ratio versus power. And there are three uh, Pareto optimal points. Uh, the brute force method obviously finds all of them. Uh, which does uh, uh, a full search, but the, uh, our non-dominated quantum search algorithms also find all these at a much lower complexity. So again, this four-component objective function uh, really is a very challenging one, typically a non-convex problem, uh, but the future is rather than setting these as constraints, what we have to do is actually jointly optimize them and then load up that particular operating mode, which is the most appropriate uh, for a handset or when you are sitting in a car. And so the whole plethora of issues I haven't even touched upon, uh, it's in this slide, but it's really uh, a, a beginning uh, of a new era and I just really invite you to sort of join our little closely knit team on designing this integrated ground and space networks of the near future. Welcome to Communications version 2.0. So thank you so much. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Laios. Uh, I'm not sure how we can give you a clap, but I'll try my own. <laughs> well, I give you a clap, guys. <laughs> uh, Okay, that that was great. It was very relevant to our project as well, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff on the aerial. You opened our minds a little bit on the different options of UAVs and so on. Uh, so I'm checking here our Q and A. I don't see any any pending questions. Uh, we only have a, a you know a minute or two to ask. Maybe I'll ask one, and if there's anybody else in the panel who wants to ask something, uh, we can have a very quick uh, Q and A. So and my the question, audience could also send me an email at some stage that I can be a bit more specific. But yeah, fire away, Christus. Excellent. Yeah, that's uh, that's good information to know. So I just wanted to pick your brains on, uh, you know, we have a number of techniques that are now candidates for 6G and so on. Uh, you know, large intelligence services. You touched upon massive MIMO, maybe energy harvesting or radiated, uh, you know, wireless power transfer. So any thoughts on which of these you would think are appropriate for these type of networks and maybe which would not be appropriate? Well, I guess uh, for the UAVs, the quadcopters at 100 meters or so, we really have to use laser guns at rooftops because otherwise they always have to land every 30 or 60 minutes uh, to be recharged and you know we, we just can't afford the OPEX uh, ramifications of this despite the whole platter of papers uh, but therefore of course you know different challenges but the high altitude ones which are solar charged are, are very good and uh, you know as for 6G again we can have power transfer uh, for relatively short distances for, for indoor scenarios uh, but for, for outdoors, the, the power always remains an issue. And that's why I think the Pareto optimization is a good idea because ultimately, uh, if you have a handset and uh, you, you have to be more power conscious uh, when you're walking, but in the car, you know, power is less of a problem. And so you then go for throughput and, and reducing the delay, URLC and stuff. But I think I used up the, the time and I don't want to cut into Federico's talk. So much look forward yeah. to that. And thank you so much, guys. Okay, thanks a lot, Laios. Yeah, we're, I think we should be conscious that uh, we're a bit behind with time. So thanks again, Laios, for, for your contribution. It was very uh, mind opening. Uh, so, if I can now hand over, probably, uh, Laius, if you can, yeah, stop sharing your screen, please, so we can.
hand over uh, the presentation. Uh, can, right? can... Laios, am I allowed a five second question to you? Yeah, while well, uh, we switch, you can. <laughs> okay. So, Laios, I mean, thank you very much. It's a great presentation, many things there. Uh, quick question. Uh, are there any any experimental trials uh, already involving either aircrafts or, uh, you know, UAVs, et cetera, that uh, you're uh, familiar with? Uh, I think only on on rather limited scale, but uh, I'm aware of some studies, uh, for example, by Dave Matolak in the U.S., uh, but, you know, these are sporadic experiments based on UAVs or aircraft in general, right? So, uh, still uh, in the feasibility phase, basically, and uh, technology readiness level of zero or so. But uh, thank you so much, guys, and, uh, you know, just drop me an email, Constantinos. Take care. Yes, of course. Okay, take care, Lion.